on behalf of the MCS Department and KMDI, instant reviews. KMDI is a knowledge media design institute at the University of Toronto. I'm pleased to welcome Richard Stallman as our speaker. Richard, or RMS, is a well-known activist, free software developer, and founder of the Free Software Foundation. He is the author of Emacs, a lead contributor to the GNU project. And founded the GNU project. Pardon me for not raising it to that level. And he did something with the GNU general public license. He is a passionate advocate about free software, and I'm sure that will come through in his talk. We are pleased to host him. One procedural note I will ask, please set your cell phones to stun mode. With that, I will exit stage right in my acting job and leave the proceedings for Richard for his talk entitled, Copyright and Versus Community in the Age of Computer Networks. Well, I think we'll all agree that although your first part was a small one, you performed it very well. Thank you. Next time, perhaps you can have one of the leading roles. This is not a speech about free software, but I better explain something about it to give you an introduction. See, this is a speech that answers a question that people used to ask me after I gave a speech about free software. So I better give you a bit of that speech so you can understand why they would ask the question. Free software means software that respects the user's freedom. It's unfortunate that English doesn't have a clear word that means free as in freedom. In French, if I said logiciel libre, it would be clear, but I'm not saying gratuit. I'm talking about freedom, not price. So think of free speech, not free beer. Difficult as that might be for some of you. In order to understand properly the word free when it's used in the combination of free software, what does it mean to respect the user's freedom? There are four essential freedoms that the user of software must always have. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and then change it so the program does what you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help your neighbor. That is the freedom to distribute copies of the program to others when you wish, up to and including republication, if that's what you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions up to publication, if you wish, when you wish. For these four freedoms, the users are free individually and collectively to take control of their software, make it do what they wish, and to cooperate as decent, upright members of their community. If a program is not free software, that means it's unethical, proprietary software. It means that the social system of the program's distribution and use is unethical. Regardless of what the program does, regardless of how useful that job might be, it's being done in an unethical way. And that unethical social system is going to cause problems. So the aim of the free software movement is to replace, is to correct the social problem of proprietary software. To replace that unjust social system with an ethical social system that respects users' freedom. I founded this movement in 1983. And in order to make freedom a reality, I began developing a free software operating system. The computer is useless without an operating system that won't do anything. So to have any chance of using computers in freedom, we needed a free software operating system. And I, being an operating system developer, set out to develop one. I set out to develop a GNU operating system, where GNU stands for GNU is not Unix. 
which is a humorous way of giving credit to Unix for technical ideas, and at the same time stating the most important thing about the system, it's not Unix, because Unix was and is proprietary software, impossible to use in freedom. To make something that we could use in freedom, we had to make something else. And the fact that it was else was crucial. That was what enabled to us developers of it to make it free software. <clears throat> so I began the development of Gnu in January 1984. By 1992, the Gnu project had nearly all the essential components of an initial free software operating system. And in 1992, the last gap was filled by a kernel named Linux. Linux first became available in 1991, but it was not free software at first. In 1992, its developer changed the license, adopting the GNU General Public License and that made it free software. And as a result, the combination of the incomplete GNU system and the kernel Linux made for the first time a free operating system for modern computers. For the first time it was possible to use a PC without any non-free software installed on it. And thus, the goal of freedom that we had set out for almost a decade earlier had been reached. And as this GNU plus Linux system caught on in popularity, even though the users got confused and they thought the whole thing was Linux and they didn't realize it was the result of our protracted campaign for freedom, still more and more people started inviting me to give speeches about free software in which I would explain the ethical ideas of the free software movement what I've summarized briefly just now. And sometimes at the end, people would ask a question, do these ideas apply to anything other than software? What about hardware, they would say. Now that was just trying to be a smart out. But what about computers? Should computers be free? What about microphones and tables and cars? Well, this is a ridiculous question when you just apply the meaning of freedom that we're talking about here to those things. Remember, to, for it to be free means it respects the four freedoms for the user. Well, do those, do those freedoms make sense for physical objects? Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. For something else, it would mean the freedom to use that thing as you wish. And in general, if you own a physical object, you're free to use it as you wish. Now, there are certain ways of using it that might be illegal. You know, if you, if you have a, a computer to send email with, you could commit fraud. Well, if you, that's illegal whether you do it with your computer or with a pencil or your voice or what. Uh, not everything is allowed, but basically you are free to use your physical objects as you wish. So that freedom you've got. So in, the, so in the world of physical objects, we're already better off most of the time than we are in the world of software. And what about freedom number one, the freedom to study and change the source code to make the program do what you wish? Well, physical objects don't have source code. And you can't just edit your physical objects with a text editor and make them different. You may be able to modify them. And in general, if you own a physical object, you could modify it any way you like. But in certain areas, there are limits. You know, if you modify a car, you may have, or an airplane, you may have to get it inspected and, uh, before you're allowed to use it. And uh, a house, you, uh, you may need to get permission to make some changes outside. Uh, but for the most part, if you have a physical object, you're free to change it as you wish to the extent it's feasible. But because there isn't a source code and there isn't a compiler, the feasibility of these changes can be limited. For instance, nobody can modify a computer chip without destroying it. There's just no way. And what about freedom number two? 
the freedom to copy it and distribute the copies. Well, that doesn't make any sense. There are no copiers for physical objects. There are no car copiers, for instance. It might be nice, you know, if, if I owned a car, I really wouldn't mind if somebody walked up with his car copier, connected one end to my car, out the other end grew another car just like it, but I hope with a different lock. And then he would pick up his car copier, get into his car, I presume it would have a copy of the gasoline in the tank too, and then drive away. But this is pure science fiction. Today, this, the question of whether people should be free to do that is a meaningless question, since they can't. And likewise, the idea of copying modified versions and distributing, distributing the copies is meaningless. So what we come up with is basically physical objects are free to the extent that they possibly could be. There's no real question there. But there are areas where that question does make real sense. And that is for various kinds of works made out of information that you might have a copy of inside your computer. Because those are things that you can copy and you can change. And so the question of whether you're allowed to do so is a real question and an important question. Now, if you have something that's been published and it's not a computer program, in general, the only thing that's going to restrict your use of it or whether you can copy or change it is copyright law. That's not true for programs. Uh, bizarrely, distributors of programs are allowed to make people sign contracts restricting them or tying them up every which way. But for other kinds of things, that doesn't normally happen. So it's only copyright law that might deny you any of these four freedoms for anything other than software. And thus, the question can be, the same question looking from the other side can be posed as, what should copyright law say about those other kinds of works other than software? To look at this question, I think we should begin by looking at the history of copyright law. And the history of copyright law is tightly connected with the history of copying technology. And for good reason. Now, changes in technology can't change basic ethical principles because those are too deep for something superficial to reach them. However, when we apply ethical principles to an actual practical decision, we do it by looking at the consequences of the various options. And a change in context that changes the consequences of an option can make it better or worse than it was before. So for instance, if we could reliably resurrect the dead, then killing somebody wouldn't be so bad. You just meant to kill or pay for your new body. Right? A change in the context would change our ethical conclusions about a particular question. <clears throat> so let's look at the history of copying technology. Copying began in the ancient world, where it was done with a writing implement on a surface. Basically, you read one copy and you wrote another. Now, this technology had certain consequences. First of all, it had no inherent economy of scale. Making 10 copies took 10 times as long as making one copy. Second, it required no special skill or equipment beyond that used for reading and writing. Anybody who was literate, of course, that was a minority in most cases, most places and times, uh, anyone who was literate could copy a book about as well as anybody else could. <clears throat> the result of this was that copying was done in a decentralized way. Any, any place where there was a copy, somebody might make another copy of it. As far as I can tell, there was nothing like copyright in the ancient world. 
If you had a copy of a book and you wanted to copy it, you were allowed to copy it. Um, unless the king didn't like what the book said, in which case he might have you executed. But eventually there was a big advance in copying technology, the printing press. The printing press made copying. What's doing this? It seems as if something is rubbing this, but nothing is. <laughs> is there a ghost? I was lunched. What? I was lunch. <laughs> I didn't have lunch. <laughs> Some kinds of copying became a lot more efficient, and others were not helped at all. Because, you see, the printing press has an inherent economy of scale. It takes a lot of work to set the type. But once you've done that, you can make many identical copies very quickly. So the printing press was only efficient for mass production. Second, the printing press and the type were expensive, specialized equipment that most literate people didn't have and didn't know how to use either. So the result was a system of centralized mass production. Copies of any given book would be made in a few places, and then they would be transported to all the various people who wanted to read a copy. <clears throat> In the first centuries of printing, hand copying continued to be common. A large fraction of all copies of books were made by hand. Typically, this was done either for very rich people to show how rich they were, or by poor people, because as the song goes, time ain't money if all you've got is time. So poor people, there were many poor people who couldn't afford a printed copy, but did have the time to copy the book by hand. Copyright began in the age of the printing press. I think the earliest copyright-like systems were in were around 1500. The English system of copyright began as a system of censorship. To get permission to publish a book, one had to get would have to go to the government to ask for permission. And the result, what the government gave was a monopoly, a permanent monopoly belonging to a publisher. This system was perhaps effective for censorship, but nothing else. Uh, after the, uh, I think it's the Glorious Revolution, the censorship system became obsolete. And it was replaced with a system of copyright belonging to the author for 14 years. And the idea began to develop that copyright could be a system to encourage writing by making it more feasible for authors to make money from writing. 
This was made explicit in the U.S. Constitution because there was a proposal to a proposal that authors should be entitled to a copyright, and it was rejected. Instead, the decision was made that Congress would be allowed to establish a copyright system as a means of promoting progress. So that decision, that part of the Constitution represents a number of decisions, which I believe are actually generally accepted, or at least were, in the English-speaking world. And one of them is that copyright is not an entitlement, it's not something that authors deserve. Rather, it's an artificial scheme to modify their behavior, to get them to do something for the public good. And what is that public good? It is having more things written and published, more books that you could buy and read, more conversation about important social questions that might help society to deal with them better, at least might have helped before the age of the corporate media. And the other interesting decision in the U.S. Constitution was that it says copyright must last for a limited time. Of course, the media companies have been working hard ever since then to give people the wrong idea. They want people to believe that copyright is something that authors are entitled to have and then hand over to publishers for exercise. They don't want people to think about the system in the proper context, which is as an artificial system by which we, the public, hope to achieve something we want. Now, copyright in the age of the printing press functioned as an industrial regulation because it only restricted things that publishers could do. It didn't restrict what ordinary readers could do. It's true that ordinary readers continued copying books by hand, but nobody ever thought of trying to sue them because it was understood as an industrial regulation. The purpose was understood. And because it functioned as an industrial regulation, it was fairly painless, easy to enforce, and arguably beneficial. It was fairly painless because the readers were not restricted, so they had no reason to complain. It was easy to enforce because it only had to be enforced against publishers, and it's easy to find who's publishing the book. You go and see where they're being sold and say, where do you get these? It wasn't necessary to invade everybody's home and everybody's computer. And finally, it was arguably beneficial because the public traded away a freedom that it couldn't exercise anyway, so in practice, the value of that freedom was zero. And in exchange, the public received benefits, the benefits of moral authorship. If you have something worthless to you and you can trade it for something else, it's got to be a good deal. So copyright in the age of the printing press was not very controversial. But the age of the printing press is giving way to the age of the computer networks, a new advance in copying technology, digital information technology. It's an advance because it makes it easier for all of us to copy and manipulate information. But not everyone wants us to be able to copy and manipulate information ourselves. There are those that want to have a stranglehold on the doing of these things. Digital information technology has changed the effect of copyright law. Even if the law itself were unchanged, its effect would be different. Whereas it used to be a power wielded by authors over publishers and providing benefits 
to the public. Now it's wielded by publishers against the public in the name of the authors. <clears throat> so what would democratic governments do in a situation like this? Seeing that the freedom that in the copyright bargain, as it used to be called, the public trades away in exchange for the benefit of increased publication activity, that that freedom, which used to be useless and of no interest to the public, is now very useful and the public wants to exercise it, the public wants to copy and share. What would a democratic government do? If the government is engaged in selling something of ours, like our freedom on our behalf, and sees that we want to keep it, what it would say is, we're going to have to renegotiate this deal. We can't go on selling the public's freedom as we used to. We're going to have to enable the public to keep some of that freedom and exercise it. Maybe not all of it. Maybe this, this doesn't necessarily mean abolishing copyright, but certainly reducing the extent of copyright powers. We can measure the non-democratic nature of our governments by their tendency to do the exact opposite. In every dimension around the world, copyright power has been increased and extended showing that these governments are doing what the media companies not want. They're not, res they're not responding to the people. <clears throat> Consider, for instance, the dimension of time. Many countries have been extending the time period of copyright. In the U.S., this was done in 1998. They added 20 years to the duration of copyrights on both old works and works yet to be written. Now, how they intend extending copyright for 20 years on the works of the 1920s to result in more authorship back in the 1920s, they haven't told us. If they have a time machine, they apparently have not used it because our history books still record that authors in the 1920s didn't, ex didn't count on copyright to be extended in 1998. Theoretically, you could imagine that 20 more years of copyright now might encourage more production of works today, but it's absurd to think that this will actually happen. Economists will point out that the marginal value, the added value of 20 more years of copyright discounted for 75 years in the future is essentially zero. And any business that wants to claim that it needs 75, it needs 95 instead of 75 years of copyright for a work made for hire, had better justify this by presenting its projected balance sheets for 75 years in the future. Of course, they can't do that. Corporations generally don't even look five years ahead. There's no surer way to ensure a resource will be despoiled than to give it into the ownership of a corporation. So, <clears throat> what, can we, uh, what can we think? Well, clearly this was just an excuse. Those politicians have been bought. In the U.S., this is done with campaign contributions. They had been bought, they just needed an excuse that would sound at least slightly plausible when it was not really examined. And they counted on the corporate media not to really examine the excuse that they were given. <clears throat> In fact, that law, <clears throat> that law is known to us as the, well, that law is officially known as the Sonny Bono Copyright Act. Sonny Bono used to be a musician, but he then became one of the Church of Scientology's head congressman. The Church of Scientology makes a practice of using copyright law to suppress information about what the church 
tells people at a certain level that it really believes. It doesn't want the public to know that and has a habit of suing for copyright infringement when the information is circulated. So, of course, they told their congressman to get on the right committee to be in charge of copyright. And then Sonny Bono died. Well, no great loss. But <laughs> was replaced by his wife, who I believe was also a member of the Church of Scientology. And then they named this law after him. But we usually call it the Mickey Mouse Copyright Act. And the reason is it was paid for by Disney. Disney was aware that in not too many years the copyright on Steamboat Willie was going to expire. Steamboat Willie was the first film in which Mickey Mouse appeared. And whenever that film went into the public domain, if it ever did, uh, then people would be free to draw a similar character in their own works. Mickey, uh, Disney was quite happy to uh, borrow from from another film to make Steamboat Willie, but didn't want that to have anyone else to have the same privilege ever. So Disney paid for this extension of copyright by 20 years, and the plan is known as perpetual copyright on the installment plan. You see. Even today, the movie companies can't get a constitutional amendment passed. They're not quite powerful enough for that. So they can't officially establish perpetual copyright. So instead, they just extend copyright by 20 years every 20 years. And so this way, if you point at any particular work, there is nominally some date when it will go into the public domain. But don't hold your breath because that date is like tomorrow, it never comes. By the time you get there, they've postponed it, always. That's their plan. Their plan is that nothing should ever go into the public domain again. <clears throat> and I'm sad to say, when there is a problem in the United States, the United States government doesn't try to solve it. Instead, it tries to impose it on the rest of the world. Many other countries have extended copyright under U.S. pressure. And I don't know whether Canada has done this yet, but I believe a, a copyright bill is being considered now, and it surely isn't anything good. Maybe there's someone here who can tell us details about that when I'm done. That would be useful. <clears throat> The other dimension in which copyright has been extended is the, de the dimension of breadth. What activities does copyright power cover? Now, in the age of the printing press, copyright was never intended to cover all uses of a published copyrighted work. Copyright was the exception within a broader space of unregulated uses. There were just certain things that everyone wasn't allowed to do. But the media companies want total control. And to that end, they've established in many countries laws which give them give publishers the power to write their own copyright rules. Of course, this too started in the US. In 1998, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was passed. <clears throat> And it gives publishers that total power by saying that if they implement whatever rules they want in some kind of authorized player, then anything that enables people to bypass those limitations is illegal. If you were in the United States, there are a few rights that you would still nominally have. And one of them is that if you buy a DVD, you have a right to watch it. But the free software that you could use to watch it is, is censored in the United States. Its distribution is forbidden. So you can buy a DVD, but you can't use it, not even privately, in a free way. The only authorized players are designed to restrict you. That is, they implement Digital Restrictions Management, or DRM. 
They are designed, they are products designed to restrict their users. We have a campaign against DRM, which you can find in the site defectivebydesign.org. And I hope that you will all go to that site and sign up and participate in protest actions. We, some of our protests have made the news, but we need people to actually go out on the street and protest in order to make them effective. <clears throat> so, of course, the United States government is trying to impose this on other countries. In France today, it's illegal even to possess a copy of the free software that is capable of watching an encrypted DVD. <clears throat> so you can see this attempt to restrict the users in all across the spectrum of media. <clears throat> in music, for many years we've seen corrupt discs that look like compact discs, but they're not real compact discs. They're corrupt discs because they're designed so that you can't read them you can't read the, the music files into your computer and then use them as you wish. <clears throat> and in some countries, they are required to label these. They can't call them compact discs. They have to call them, they have, they have another symbol, copy control. And then they say, this disc can be played on Windows and Macintosh systems. That is, in effect, to say that they can't be played on free operating systems like GNU plus Linux. Once I was giving a speech in Spain and my hosts gave me uh, what looked like a, a record of music from a uh, musician from their region and what I, I wanted to listen to it, but before I opened it, I noticed that it said copy control. So I gave it back to them and I said, please take this I said, here we see the face of the enemy. Please take this back to the store because I don't want them to keep your money. <clears throat> and that's what you should do too. You should not buy products that are designed to restrict you. Care about your freedom enough to stand up for it. So if a product is uh, afflicted with DRM, then unless you have the means to break the DRM, don't buy it. So don't buy DVDs unless you have the free software that can read them. <clears throat> Since there is free software that can read the encrypted DVDs, it should be no surprise that the movie companies are trying to replace that with a new system. That system is called AACS, and that describes what we should give it. We should give it the axe. You can find that system in HD DVD, and I think you can find it in Blu-ray as well. And I'm happy to say that the axe has cracked. A few months ago, people cracked it, and there was already some software being distributed that contained the algorithm. All that was needed was a certain code. And so people found the code and they started publishing it. And they were, the people, the places where it was published were ordered to take this down and they started deleting it. And they started deleting it again and again and again until they gave up because they couldn't delete so many postings. Ultimately, hundreds of thousands of web pages contain that code. There are pictures of cute pets together with this 16 digit hex number <laughs> circulating on the net. <clears throat> it was a, an upswell of popular resistance against a new tyranny. <clears throat> but they're not defeated yet. Just seeing that the spirit of resistance can well up doesn't mean we have won. <clears throat> Sony became quite notorious for its
corrupt disks. These corrupt disks were designed so that when they were put into a Windows system, a program would be loaded off this disk, ostensibly a, a music CD. And it was installed into the system, and then it hid its own presence. And it also damaged the security of the system, but its purpose, of course, was just to restrict you in playing that disk. And to make it even more absurd, this software was found to contain, aside from being criminal for various reasons, from what I've already told you, it was also found to contain illegally copied free software that had been released under the GNU General Public License <laughs> and was being distributed without a notice of the freedoms, without the source code, and look, that's copyright infringement. But Sony wasn't wasn't prosecuted for copyright infringement. It's only the ordinary citizens that are expected to uh, obey these laws. Anyway, there was a lot of anger at Sony. Most of it not because of what Sony had tried to do, which was to restrict the users, even though I think that's the nastiest thing of all. Instead, the anger was mostly because of all the other nasty things they had done along the way. And Sony promised it would never do that again. It would never again put a rootkit on its CDs. So now the plan is to have the rootkit built into your computer before you get it. And that is called Windows Vista. <laughs> designed specifically to restrict. That's its purpose. It's designed to be tighter chains than ever before, harder to escape from. <clears throat> Windows Vista requires users to throw away lots of perfectly good hardware, which they chose not to support because that hardware wasn't designed specifically to restrict the users. And restricting the users is the purpose of Windows Vista. And that's why we have the badvista.org campaign. It's to encourage resistance so people won't downgrade to Vista. Why, even if you're not ready to escape to the free world, which is what you really should do, at least don't let Microsoft tighten the chains on you. <clears throat> Vista is one big back door. It's designed so that it uh, can be so that Microsoft can impose an upgrade or a downgrade, whichever, whichever we might call it. The point is, you can't stop Microsoft from changing the software on the computer. And the reason they will do this, of course, is if they ever see users appearing to escape from the power that they wish to maintain, they can force those users into new software. They can even send a message directing the system to refuse to use a certain model of hardware. If they find that the, the people have as used a certain model of hardware to escape from these restrictions, they'll just send a command telling everybody's computer to stop working with that hardware and make everybody buy new hardware. Now, what arrogance. This should be illegal right just by itself. But apparently it isn't because our governments are not working for us. <clears throat> and then, of course, there are books. You might have heard some seven years ago a big, you might have seen the hype campaign for ebooks. What was the reason for this? I think I know. You see, the book publishers would like to take away certain traditional freedoms that book readers enjoy. For instance, there is the freedom to uh, borrow a book from the library, the freedom to sell it to a used bookstore, the freedom to lend it to your friend, the freedom to buy a book anonymously by paying cash, and there's even the freedom to keep the book for as long as you want and read it as many times as you want and pass it on perhaps to your children who might also read it 
as many times as they want. They want to get rid of all these freedoms, but they realize that if they simply try to do this, they might face opposition. So they came up with a two-stage plan to do it. First, they took away these freedoms for e-books. That was done in the U.S. with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And then they figured, let's get people to switch from paper books to e-books. And they'll adopt e-books because I think it's all so wonderful to be technically advanced. And they won't pay attention to the fact that e-books don't come with the same freedoms as paper books do. And then nobody will ever see an e-book that didn't restrict them. And so once we've switched everybody over to e-books, they'll all have lost their freedom. Well, it didn't work. <clears throat> the first step worked, but the second step didn't. They didn't get people to switch from paper books to e-books. Uh, but I don't think the reason was that people value their freedom too much. I think it was probably something about convenience of reading off the screen. So they're going to try again. Every so often we see articles about, I think it's called uh, electronic paper, which is something that looks like a book, except that each sheet is really a bitmap display. And you can download an e-book into it and read it. And you can be sure that when they really implement this, they will leave out the feature of being able to copy the e-book out of this reader. And if people use these things, what would it imply? Well, you'd lend a book to a friend, but you wouldn't lend your, your electronic paper reader to a friend, because that would be your whole library at once. So if they can get people to use those things, that's the end of lending books to your friend, and they'll probably make those books expire after two weeks or whatever. There is a dental school in the U.S. where the students don't get textbooks anymore. They just get e-books that expire after a year. So this thread is not entirely gone. I had an interesting brush with this. There was a publisher that thought it would be nice to start off its line of e-books with my biography. <laughs> so they sent a, a writer to talk to me and ask if I would cooperate. And I said, sure, if this ebook is published unencrypted. And so he went back and talked to the publisher, and the publisher wouldn't agree. So then I said, why don't you try that other publisher? They might agree. And they did. And so the book was eventually published. And it's not only unencrypted on the net, it's actually free. Uh, people are, with all four freedoms, you can publish your modified version. <laughs> <laughs> so you could make, if you, if, whether you like or dislike the speech, you could make a modified version saying so, and you can redistribute that. <clears throat> now, I know that there was an organized hype campaign for ebooks. And the reason is, Early in this decade, I was on a domestic airliner in Brazil. And I pulled out the in-flight magazine, basically by accident. And in the place where there would be, one, in a real magazine, an editorial, there was an article speculating about how many years it would take before we were all reading e-books. Now, they never publish anything in those unless they're making money specifically from that art somehow. And since that wasn't designed to encourage people to take vacations by airplane, they must have been being paid some other way. There must have been an organized hype campaign trying to get people to give up their freedoms by switching to e-books. And with that kind of organized campaign going on, <clears throat> We can be sure that they'll do it again. We have to be constantly ready to defend our freedom. Well, that's what's been happening. That's what our 
undemocratic governments have been doing to us. But what would governments do if they were democratic? <clears throat> well, they would reduce the amount of power that they hand over to be exercised over us. So, there's a dimension of time. What do I suggest for that? And now I'm getting to the answer to the question that people used to ask me. <clears throat> Instead of extending copyright, copyright's term, we should reduce it. In the past few decades, the public's publication cycle has been getting shorter and shorter. I only know the information for the U.S., but I expect it's similar here. Most books are uh, remaindered within two years and out of print within three. So there's no reason at all why copyright should last for many decades. Let's shorten it to last for one decade starting from the date of publication. The reason for this is while we don't have copies because the work remains unpublished, there's no harm letting the author have more time to look for a publisher. There's no reason to start the clock ticking until the work is published and we actually start to get copies. <clears throat> but at that point, I suggest 10 years. I once suggested this in a panel discussion with some authors, and I expected some fireworks, and I got some. The award-winning fantasy writer sitting next to me said, 10 years, that's crazy. Anything more than five years is intolerable. <laughs> I was surprised too. You see, just like you, I had naively believed that authors were in favor of longer copyright. Because the publishers were always saying that they wanted longer copyright for the authors. But they're lying. This isn't good for most authors. For some superstars, yes. And it's always the superstars that they trot out when there are legislative hearings. And they expect us to believe that this is, goes the same for all authors, but that's not true. The fact is that these publishers in all media have the habit of grinding those same authors into the ground with their heels. At the same time as they're demanding more power over us in the name of those authors, they're mistreating those authors constantly at every opportunity. This author had a contract which said that when the publisher lets the book go out of print, the rights revert to him. Well, practically speaking, his book was out of print, but the publisher wouldn't admit it. So he had a legal dispute with his publisher just to get back the permission to distribute copies of his own books so that people could read them. And that's what, above all, he wanted. He wasn't a superstar, even though he won an award. He hadn't got to the point where he thought of this as mainly a way to get riches. He was writing because he wanted people to read his books, which is what every author starts out wanting. And the publisher was the obstacle to this. <clears throat> I've come to find out that this is not unusual and extends to all fields. He knew that more than five years of copyright was not going to benefit him unless by unlikely chance he was tremendously successful. So he advocated five years of copyright. At least that way, after five years, he'd be able to distribute his own books again. <clears throat> well, maybe after... I still think we should try 10 years as the first step. You know, we make a big adjustment, and later on we can tune it one way or the other. If we see 10 years is still too long, we can shorten it. Or maybe we can make it a little longer. We can just watch the results for a while and see. In any case, 10-year copyright would get rid of the bulk of the problem that we have now, where copyright can last for sometimes 150 years. The other dimension, of course, is the breadth of copyright. And there, too, we should reduce it, but not the same for all works. We don't have to make the same deal for everything we, we buy. We don't have to pay the same price. 
There's just no reason why we should. And so it makes sense for governments to arrange the best possible deal for each kind of work. So I propose to distinguish between three categories of works in which the right deal is different. Distinguishing them not by medium, but rather by the way that the works are contribute to society. So the first category is works that serve a function of practical purpose. Works that you use to do a practical thing in your life. The second category is works that witness the thoughts of certain parties. And the third category is works of art and entertainment. These works contribute in different ways to society. I'm not comparing the importance of them to say that one is more important than another. I'm saying that they're important in different ways. And that because of the different ways we use them, the way to treat them, the best way to treat them is different. First, let's look at the category of practical functional works, works that you use to do something practical in your life. These include computer programs, recipes, educational works, reference works, text fonts, and maybe to some extent designs for building other kinds of things to the extent that people in general can make use of those designs. <clears throat> These works, I believe, must be free. Free in the same sense that software, which is one of them, must be free. Free with the same four freedoms. And the reason is, if you use the work to do the practical things in your life, you must be free to control the things you do. So you must be free to change the work so it does what you want. And when you've done that, you've got to be free to publish your version. Society needs this so that your changes can be available to others. So there we've already got the freedom to change it and the freedom to publish your modified versions. But what about distribution of unmodified copies? Well, the fact is, when we look at modified versions, how much change does it take to qualify as a modified version? Obviously, you could make a trivial change that doesn't really alter the, the functionality. There's no way to permit repub your publication of your modified versions and not permit publication of unchained versions. They all have to be permitted. <clears throat> now, you might say, or 20 years ago, you might have said, and it might have been rational to say, that you doubted whether, in the absence of a scheme to restrict the users, we would produce the works that society needs. Well, I would say that a proprietary program has no contribution to society, and it's better to discourage that. After all, it's just something that takes away freedom from everyone who uses it. So I would like to maximize the amount of free software that's useful free software developed and minimize the amount of proprietary software that's developed, preferably to zero. So I don't buy logic that starts with the assumption that software is desirable whether it respects our freedom or not. But still, there might have been this worry that we wouldn't have enough of these works if we didn't restrict the users. But today, we have some experience to show us there's nothing to be afraid of. There's the free software movement, of course, which has developed thousands of useful free software packages. We now see that needs, society's needs can be satisfied with free software. In fact, the main reason that isn't completely done now is the power of the institutions that are invested in keeping the proprietary software going. And then, of course, there are all the recipes which are circulating, and effectively cooks do enjoy these four freedoms in using them, and that hasn't stopped recipes from being published for years. And then look at reference works, where we see Wikipedia, which is a great success, showing that in that area too, the public can produce free works that are very good. And then 
the educational works area is lagging behind the reference works, but it's getting going. There are free textbook projects, free textbook repositories, and more and more you can find free educational materials. And you can also find educational materials that are, that are not free, but, but they're available gratis on the net, which means that, that in fact there, nobody's being, <clears throat> which means that nobody's collecting money using copyright, so you, the authors wouldn't lose anything if they did make them free. It may just, some of them may have an emotional resistance, but there's actually no practical obstacle to their doing so. They could be making all these works, and I hope will convince them to do so, make, to make all these works free. So in this area, for, for this category of works, I believe that the same ideas that apply to software extend to this entire category. And that's how far they extend. That's the answer to that question with which I began this talk. But what about the second category, works whose purpose is to say what certain parties thought? Well, to modify those works is just to misrepresent the, the authors. That's not socially useful. There's no reason to permit publication of modified versions of these works. And when I write essays of opinion, I don't authorize publication of modified versions. Why should people be allowed to misrepresent my views? And I don't see, I think it's perfectly fine for you to do the same thing. So for this category, I would recommend that I would recommend a compromised copyright system, which would cover modification and cover commercial distribution and use of the works. But there is a minimal freedom that people must always have for every published work, and that is the freedom to non-commercially redistribute exact copies. That's sharing, and sharing creates the bonds of society. To, to attack sharing is to attack social solidarity. And that is as anti-social as anything can get. <clears throat> Thus, with this compromised copyright system, there would still more or less be a system to provide a revenue stream to authors. It would be some substantial fraction of the money that they would get now. And so things would keep on going more or less the same as they are now but we would have this essential minimum freedom. These work, works would not be free in the sense of the four freedoms, but, we would but the four freedoms, I'm, in my view, don't apply to this category. What we need is the minimum freedom to non-commercially share. Then there is the category of artistic and entertainment works whose purpose lies in the impact they make on the reader. <clears throat> for, these, for this category, the question of modification was very difficult for me to deal with at first, because there are valid arguments on both sides about whether people should be free to publish modified versions. On one, on one hand, there's the argument that a work can have an artistic integrity, and modifying it can destroy that. I think that is sometimes true, although not as often as the authors would like to have it. And you can, to, to demonstrate that, just look at how willing they are to let Hollywood butcher their works when they're paid enough. Most authors, because there are a few that really do have artistic integrity and won't allow that. But there are not that many. <clears throat> On the other hand, let's look at the case for modification which, after all, is a way to contribute to art. Consider the folk process, where a series of artists modify a work and produce something that can be very rich and beautiful. But if you want to look only at named artists, consider Shakespeare. Some of Shakespeare's plays borrowed plots from other plays that had been published just a few decades before. If today's copyright law had existed then, those plays of Shakespeare would have been illegal. 
they could not have been performed or published. And if Shakespeare had complained about this, the copyright holders would have said, oh, you just want to make a cheap ripoff. That's no contribution to society. Be off with you. And we, if we had heard that dispute, we would have had no basis, since we would never have seen or read these plays, we would have had no basis to dispute that claim that they would just be cheap ripoffs. But in fact, since these plays were published, we can say that they are great works of literature. However, what enabled me to resolve this issue to my satisfaction was to recognize that while modifying an artistic work can contribute to art, there is no super rush about it. So if copyright lasts 10 years and then the work goes into the public domain, and you're an artist and you want to make a modified version of it, well, you can wait 10 years and then release your modified version of it. This is not acceptable for works of practical use. If you're using a work to do practical things in your life today, you've got to be free to change it today. Otherwise, you don't control your own life. And freedom is controlling your own life. But that doesn't apply when it's just a matter of, of art. We can wait. We don't desperately need it. So what I propose is the same compromised copyright system where everyone is free to non-commercially redistribute exact copies, and this would last for 10 years and the work goes into the public domain, and then artists can release their modified version of it and contribute further to art. So those are my recommendations. In particular, music sharing on the internet should be legal. There's no excuse for prohibiting it. That's what Canada ought to adopt if it passes a new copyright law, legalizing internet music sharing. Let's not beat around the bush. <clears throat> now, the record companies like to pretend that this would be a disaster for musicians. But that obviously can't be true, because even if record sales go down, musicians can't lose what they're not getting. And the fact is, nearly all of the musicians that have record contracts get no money when you buy their records. When I buy commercial CDs, I feel ashamed that I'm not supporting the musicians. And that's true in just about all cases except for superstars, and not, all, not even all superstars. It's mainly the long-established superstars, the ones who have come to the end of their first record contract, and those usually involve five or seven records. Well, th if they finish that and they come out of it with clout and fame, then they can negotiate another contract that doesn't exploit them. And those are the musicians that actually make money if you buy their records. <clears throat> but the rest generally don't, unless they're wildly successful. The record companies pay 4% of their income to musicians. That's 4% on of the total go to all the musicians, 4% of the income. But that's not 4% of, that doesn't mean that each musician gets 4% of his or her sales figures. Rather, the superstars get more than 4% of their large sales figures, and the rest get much less than 4% of their much smaller sales figures. And in fact, when you buy almost, all, almost any of the CDs in the store, the amount that the musicians will get is zero, and the reason is, Although nominally there's a certain fraction of the price that is supposed to go to the musicians, in fact they never get it because the production and publicity expenses are treated as an advance to the musicians, meaning that 
that share of your purchase price goes to pay back this advance. And unless the record is wildly successful, and in some cases it can be a gold record and still not reach this point, the musicians don't start to get money from your purchase. So, <clears throat> given that the record companies treat the musicians so badly, they're not really going to lose very much if we don't buy their records. They don't really lose when we share. Now, this is not to say that the musicians don't get anything from their record contract. Of course, So, musicians, aside from superstars, won't lose much. And the superstars, well, even if they lost half their income, they'd still be doing fine. So I don't really think we should worry about them. Um, we don't need to have our freedom taken away to assure their ability to get awfully rich. So, I think it would be just fine if we only legalize music sharing and don't do anything else. But we might want to support musicians better than the current system. And I propose two ways of doing that, either of which would, would make the system better than it is now. One is through a tax. We could have a tax on anything that relates to internet use, whether it's connectivity or blank disks or whatever. And <clears throat> we could divide up this money to musicians based on their popularity, but not in linear proportion. You see, a superstar can easily be a thousand times as popular as the most fairly successful musicians. But it's inefficient use of the tax money to give the superstar a thousand times as much. So let's have a function that tapers off so that the superstar who's a thousand times as popular may get ten times as much, but not a thousand times as much. Well, this way, most of the tax money won't go to the superstars anymore. Sure, they'll get enough. They'll get plenty. But most of it will be able to support a large number of fairly popular musicians to an adequate extent so that they can be full-time musicians who don't need a day job. And that, after all, is the point. If we want this tax to support music by supporting musicians, we want to support a large, for, for a given amount of money, we want to support a large number of musicians adequately. And this is the way to do it. However, we don't have to do it with tax. We can do it with voluntary payments. Imagine that every player has a button that you can push to send one dollar to the band. And you can push it if you want or not. Nothing bad happens to you if you don't. But why not? If you like the music, why not send one dollar? You wouldn't miss one dollar. It's so little. That amount of loss to you wouldn't hold you back. Anytime you thought, this is nice, I'll give him a dollar. You would just do it. So we could imagine that some people would do this once a month. And some other people who are really enthusiastic might even do it once a week. They might even spend, say, $50 a year this way, which wouldn't matter to them unless they're really poor. But, you know, we don't need to have musicians supported by poor people. There are enough people who aren't poor and who wouldn't miss it. They'll do a fine job of supporting musicians. So let the poor people who are on it, who would really miss that one dollar, let them not send it. The rest of us can do it. And we can support musicians this way a lot better than they're supporting now. I read a few years ago that the average American spent $20 a year on music. And if this is going to records and 4% of it is going to musicians, that's $1 a year. So if the average American sent, sent a dollar to a musician once a year, 
that would support them just as well. Well, of course, there is some money going to mute to composers and songwriters too. We want to include them in the system, of course. So let's suppose half of it went to them. Well, if people pushed it, the button on an average of twice a year, they'd be supporting both the musicians and the songwriters as well as the current system. But I think we could convince a lot of people to raise that average considerably. And instead of nasty PR campaigns saying, don't you dare share, sharing is theft. <clears throat> don't you dare help your neighbor. Helping your neighbor is as bad as attacking ships. That's what it means when you call them pirates, right? It's a propaganda term that we shouldn't use. Anyway, instead of this nasty PR campaign, we can have a warm, friendly PR campaign. Have you sent a dollar to a band this week? Why not? You love their music. Send a dollar. You'll never miss it. And because this works with our feelings instead of against them, it would be tremendously successful. No one would be against it. So that's, I think, the best way to support musicians. And I think we can support other arts in the same way <clears throat> if we want to improve our support for the arts. So is there anyone here who knows details of the copyright law that Canada is now considering? <coughs> Anyone who could tell us something about that? I guess not. It's called C60. Yeah, I suspect it probably is something like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and that it would forbid software that you could use to escape from the bonds of, from the chains of digital restrictions management. Uh, I believe that's what it was a couple of years ago when it was being considered before. I just don't know for certain if it's the same now. There is a tax here on what it's used. And what's done with the money? Um, it was used to try and get a tax to put on what it's used. That's right. So it doesn't go to support musicians. Well, it, it's, it's not actually a tax. It's collected by a private company. That's unacceptable. Under government That's unacceptable. That has to be eliminated. Well, it, it has a benefit, though. It's effectively neutralized any uh, legislation against Canadian Canadian citizens for file sharing. Oh, well, that's true. But, I mean, it's strange how we in, in some other countries they establish such taxes and they forbid sharing. You know, it's it's uh, you can't see how they could have it both ways, but they do. I'm glad that if though if it leads to that effect, after all, paying a tax is not nearly as bad as losing your freedom. It's not a lot of money, after all. Well, the both ways problem was what killed the DVD tax idea. Because, of course, they wanted people to pay the tax for the DVDs, but copying video. Well, that's the way it should be. Not Let it do it. Do both. Do both. Have the tax and free people to copy. That's the way it should be. Uh, uh, but they wanted to have the tax. Well, I know, but the point is, the solution is is to say, yes, let's have this tax and give us our freedom back. But don't allow it to be collected by a private company. If we want the tax money to do good, then we've got to plan how to spend it so that it will do good. In the music area, this tapering function is the way to make sure that the tax money does the most possible good for supporting music. Any other questions? I see you propose uh, you know, this, 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 this uh, scheme for paying artists, but how do you propose to pay software programs? Oh, well, I don't have to propose any particular way uh, because we don't have a problem. The fact is, free software is being developed, and to a large extent, it's being developed by volunteers. But there are also many programmers who are getting paid to develop free software, and they're getting paid in various different ways. There is no free software business model. Because we're not in favor of any particular business model, we're not against 
any particular business model, except that we're against trampling people's freedom. But as long as you respect other people's freedom, any business model is fine with us. Now, you may, many of you may have confused us in the free software movement with a totally different uh, group or a totally different set of views, which go by the name of open source. And they propose development models. And they sometimes propose business models. And the reason is they don't want to talk about freedom as the issue. They don't want to say that proprietary user subjugating software is wrong. They don't want to say it's unethical. So instead of talking about freedoms that users should have and how to be ethical and respect other people's freedom, they talk about practicalities only. Well, what they say is sometimes useful. I just think it's missing the most important point. In any case, we are not they. And the free software movement isn't advocating any particular business model. We don't have to. Uh, you see, when you ask how should programmers get paid, in, what it sounds like the assumptions are is we need software, we need to pay programmers, how should we pay them? Should we pay them by letting them restrict the users or some other way? Well, I reject the question entirely. I don't want them to get any money by restricting the users. I'd like that wiped out because that's an evil practice. But there must be some fashion. No, 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 no. Actually, there doesn't have to be. If there's no ethical way for programmers to get paid for developing software, then it's better if they don't. It's better, it's better, if given any programmer, it's better that he doesn't get a job programming and has to look for some other kind of job than that he make money by subjugating others and denying their freedom. I'm not denying that free software is not a bad idea. The idea that we have to properly license, but you aren't proposing anything. I don't have to. Remember, free software is already being developed. You're treating it as if it were purely a theoretical proposal, and I had to demonstrate its feasibility. The facts demonstrate its feasibility. I don't have to prove to you that free software can be developed. Just look around. Some of those programmers are getting paid. Instead of asking me how I think they should get paid, you can go and look and see how they are getting paid. It's not only one answer, though. They're not all getting, the ones who are getting paid are not all getting paid in one particular way. I don't have to solve a problem when the problem doesn't exist. I don't have to solve the problem of, uh, say, how we're going to have electric lights, right? They already exist. I mean, just, it's not a problem. The system's there already and it's working already. And your question is based on a false premise that it didn't exist and that I had to prove to you that there was some way it could work. It's like asking me to, demo, to tell you how airplanes could fly. But, but it's not installed on 90% of PCs, so it's not fully working. Sorry, what did you just say? I couldn't hear you. Linux is, it, it, no, Linux is not installed on anywhere by itself. You're talking about the GNU operating system and I started it. So please don't, and I worked on it with thousands of other people, and when you call the system Linux, you're insulting us by giving us none of the credit. So please don't do that. It's the GNU plus Linux system. And yes, most users are not using it yet, but that's a different question. It's not that our system isn't adequate for them to use. It's that there are many kinds of social inertia that Microsoft plays on quite skillfully buying the support of schools at all levels, of governments, and of hardware manufacturers, all to make it difficult for people to switch. They've arranged so that when people buy computers, those computers come with windows on them. Well, that's basically pushing a lot of people, pushing almost everyone in the direction of windows. So it's no surprise that only a minority of us swim against that current enough to <coughs> not to drift with it, but don't pretend that that's a flaw of free software as such. It's a problem. It's a social problem, and it's real, this problem of inertia. We have to defeat this inertia if we don't want, if we don't want past decisions made for other reasons to determine the future of our freedom, we have to overcome this inertia. But that doesn't mean that there's a difficulty developing free software. By the way, 
most programmers are not developing either free software or proprietary software. The vast majority of programmers that are getting paid are developing custom software. And custom software is either free or proprietary in a strict sense, but not in the usual sense. Usually when we speak of free software, we mean software available to the public that, with freedom. And usually when we talk about proprietary software, we mean software available to the public but without freedom. But the custom software is being developed for one client. So it's free or proprietary depending on whether that one client gets the source code and the freedom. Well, if that client has any sense at all, he's going to insist on it. After all, he's paying for the software to get written. He's a dolt if he doesn't insist on having total control over the software he's going to run. But basically, the reason that these programmers are getting paid has to do with the fact that this client wants a program developed this year to do this particular thing. And even in a world where all software is free, those clients are still going to have to pay the programmers just the same. If we're using general purpose free software, we can often just wait for somebody else to make the improvements we want, because a lot of us want the same improvements. Somebody else will decide to make that change. But when you want some specialized thing that suits your business plan, it would be silly to wait for volunteers. Why would anybody else want that? And, and why would they do it for you anyway? No, you're going to have to pay programmers. So basically, the situation about jobs and programming wouldn't change substantially if proprietary software ceased to exist. In a world where all software was free, we'd still see the same clients paying the, probably the same programmers to write the same custom software, and that's nearly all the jobs anyway. GPL is specifically free, but does it address software as a service? I don't know what you mean by software as a service, I'm sorry. That's some kind of buzzword with no clear meaning. Well, the, 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 use, the use of services on, on a network where the user himself does not have a copy of it. Oh, well, the GPL, GP, first of all, I should explain that the new general public license is one among many free software licenses. Some people have been misinformed and they think that free software is defined to mean software released under the new GPL, but that's not the case. Any license that recognizes the four freedoms is a free software license. But the GNU GPL is the most popular, or I should say the more, most widely used free software license. About 70% of free software packages use it. Anyway, GPL version 3 does not in itself have any requirements about that situation. But the GNU Afero GPL does say things about that situation. It says if, if you're running the software on a, on a public server, you're going to have to allow the users of that server to download the source code of the version you're running. Well, this has the effect of making sure that your improvements in the software become available to the community. But this has no effect on the problem that we get when we use somebody else's copy running on his server instead of our own copy. And the fact is, if you are using, if you're doing your own computing with somebody else's server, with using somebody else's copy of the program, you can't have control over it. It doesn't matter what the license is. Even if it's 100% free software that, that that guy got off the network, you still don't control his copy. And even if the Afero GPL requires him to publish his changes, well, that would enable you to set up your own server if you wish, but it doesn't give you any control over his copy. Of course, you shouldn't have control over his copy. He's the one who has to have control over his copy. It would be absurd if he's got a thousand users and we can't give each one of those users control over his copy, the same copy, right? Suppose you want to change it one way and I'm a user and I want to change it another way. Which one of us gets to do it? But actually, none of us should because it's his copy and he has to be in charge of his copy. So it, what we see is that the practice of using a server to do your own computing 
can deny you control over your computing in the same way that using proprietary software can do so. But we don't have the same kind of solution available to the problem that proprietary software denies you control of your own computing. The, pro the solution is develop free software and use that instead. But for the problem that this freedom can be denied by the practice of using somebody else's copy, the solution is don't do that. That's the only solution. Now, this is not to say that using any kind of server is always bad. Um, when a server is basically just giving you information out of somebody else's data, then it's not really very much your computing that you're doing. What you're doing is looking through his data. I don't see any problem with that. I mean, of course, there can be other problems. There are many different unethical things people can do. This isn't the only ethical issue that applies to computing. But just the fact that you're using somebody else's server to look through his data, I don't see anything wrong with that. Another case of using a server is when there's a group effort that's doing computing. For instance, if you contribute to Wikipedia, you're using Wikipedia's server to do it. But that's okay because that's not your computing, that's Wikipedia's computing, which you are contributing to. You're participating in it, but the activity isn't yours. The activity is Wikipedia's. So Wikipedia should have control over it, and Wikipedia does, because Wikipedia is using its own servers with its own copies of software, and, have, and it's free software, so they have control over it. So there's no problem in that scenario. There's also no trick. When you speak about the software on the server and running on the server, whether it's running on the server or downloaded or running on your machine. Well, they make a difference, you see. Because well, if it's downloaded and running on your machine, then you're running a copy that's on your machine, and we can simply say it better be free. I'm about to say there need not be a difference. There but there is a difference. Listen, In listen, look, hear me out. There need not be a difference, because there need not be a single copy shared by everyone on the server. It could be an instance which is modified, customized, particularly for your use, and a number of different clients could have different Sure, the point, but that is a difference. So I agree with what you said, but, but the conclusion, I think, is 180 degrees wrong. This shows why it does make a difference. Basically, they shouldn't be downloading that software into your browser. You should have that software on your machine, and it should be free software. And then you have control over it. So it makes a big difference that it's not running on the server. If it were running on the server, you could possibly have control over it. But if because it's running on your machine, you can. It just has to be free. While I'm cognizant of freedom, as in freedom of speech, I must move things along in the interest of the rest of the evening. Uh, is there one more question that uh, Richard can address? Um, so far, we've talked about copyright, but the big question right now I can a little, but the most important thing to know is that there is essentially nothing in common between copyright law and patent law. So, in fact, that you ask this question here, I think, represents a widespread misconception that these two laws somehow belong together. But they don't. They're totally different. And the issues they raise have nothing in common. Uh, this misconception comes from the, uh, the fashionable term, quote, intellectual property, unquote, which is a misleading term because it lumps together laws that are totally different. And so you'll see people talking about copyright law, but calling it intellectual property. And then over here, somebody is talking about patent law, but calling it intellectual property. And most people will, will mistakenly conclude that they're both talking about the same thing. But they're not. They're talking about totally different laws, who's, which are different on every point. So the only way to think clearly is to reject completely the use of the term intellectual property and always say, which law are we talking about here? 
so as to prevent mixing up these two different topics. As you can see, I'm not totally against copyright law. I'm also not totally against patent law, but it should not be applied to software. Applying patent law to software creates a problem because developing a large program involves combining thousands of ideas. And if any one of those ideas might be patented, well, suppose 10% of them are, well, out of your thousands of ideas, that means you put in hundreds of ideas that are patented, and then you're facing hundreds of possible lawsuits. It's an, an absurd system of getting software developers tied up in knots. It's bad for all software developers. However, because the mega corporations own about half the patents, they, and they cross-license each other, they figure that they will gain on the balance. They'll, what they'll gain is a certain amount of power over the whole field. So software patents should not exist. And the best way to, to show this to people outside the field is with an analogy between software and, say, symphonic music or novels. You know, a symphony combines a lot of musical ideas. A novel combines hundreds, maybe thousands, of literary plot and story ideas. Uh, well, suppose each one of those could be patented. Would, how would this affect composers or novelists? What it would mean is it would just get them tied up in legal difficulties. With copyright, at least the fact is whoever writes it has the copyright. So <clears throat> there's no danger that somebody you've never heard of and have had no dealings with might have the copyright on what you write. But it is almost certain that if you write a substantial program, there are patent holders with which you have had no dealings that have patents over ideas implemented in your program. If you want to see more about this, look at gnu.org slash philosophy slash software dash literary dash patents dot html. <laughs> and you will see this analogy worked out in specific examples that would bring it home to everybody. But patents are patents is a the patent law is a totally different subject from the one that the speech has been about. Patent law and copyright law have essentially nothing in common. In the US, they have one sentence in the Constitution in common, which is a very small amount of commonality, but every detail is different. And by the way, the term intellectual property law is, as normally used, also includes trademark law, which is even more different from copyright law and patent law, and isn't even meant as an incentive for anything. So you'll find lots of people saying, intellectual property is a system of incentives. They're already wrong. That's true. Well, copyright law is, patent law is, and trademark law is not. You will find even law professors that teach these subjects go wrong when they try to generalize too far, and that's all that term does. So anytime you see someone using that term, say, hold on, this, this discussion is already confused. These laws are too different to say anything about them together. Pick one. This, to have a clear discussion, we have to identify a specific topic. Intellectual property is not a coherent reference to anything. So I've been told that uh, that's it. I'm sorry. <laughs> On behalf of the MCS department and KMDI as sponsoring institutions, I thank you for coming, and now I invite you to thank our speaker for <laughs>